refugia as a concept I find has um, been explained in a really confusing fashion in the past and that, that really it's attained this like um, almost like mythical thing where I don't really, I've heard about it but I don't really know what it means and I don't really know how it applies to me. Um, the way I like to describe it is that parasites have to mate when they're inside a sheep. A female parasite has to find a male parasite and then the genetics is you, you understand it because you're doing it every day with your ram and your ewe is that if a female parasite carries a trait that allows it to survive my drench and it mates with a male parasite that carries that same trait their kids the next generation of worms the eggs that pass out of your sheep in the fecal egg count they are going to carry resistant traits Resistant, mate with resistant equals resistant kids, right? If on the other end of the spectrum I have a susceptible parasite, the worm that I want it is killed by my drench, right? That worm, if it mates with another susceptible parasite, their kids are susceptible. I can continue to control that population of worms. Now, the concept of refugia is if I drench every single stock class on my farm, today with a drench and I wipe out all the susceptible worms while that might be good for my productivity right now very quickly I create a very high proportion of the parasites that are resistant carry the resistant traits even though they're in low numbers today they only find resistant mates to mate with and the only kids the only next generation of parasites are strongly resistant to my drench Refuser is how do I maintain a clean farm but keep susceptible parasites in the mix so that when a resistant gene pops up, when a resistant worm looks for a mate, all he can find is a susceptible individual. Because when that mating occurs, the next generation of kids, the worms that come out of that mating, are more susceptible, less resistant than that resistant parasite was. I've diluted out how strong that resistance trait is by mating it with a susceptible worm. And refusia comes about by not using heaps of chemical all the time. The only way that susceptible parasites stay in my system are when I don't kill them with drench. Now, it's really important to think about this, and I like to talk about a seesaw that a resistant parasite is not any worse for production than a susceptible parasite. They're both equally damaging to the sheep. I can just kill one and not the other. And let's have a think about a clean Italian paddock that's never had a sheep on it. There's not a parasite on there. I put sheep on there and that clean paddock is awesome for productivity. My high quality feed that's got no worms on it, my lambs will grow like stink. But there is not a susceptible parasite on that block. And if I drench my lambs onto that paddock, the only worms that will come out of my lambs are resistant to my drench. The only matings that will be able to occur are resistant, resistant. And then the only next generation of worms on that paddock will be resistant to my drench. While that paddock was clean and had no refugia, it's very easy to develop a highly resistant population on it. The other end of the seesaw is the filthiest, most contaminated paddock in the world that's had lambs dying on it all of last autumn. That paddock, the seething mess of parasites, is terrible for productivity, but has so much refugia on it that if you dump a few resistant worms into it, they will get swamped out and bred out in a second. They are never going to dominate that population. And the, the trick with refugia is providing enough susceptible parasites that I swamp out the resistant ones when they pop up without creating a seething mess that impacts my productivity. We want to look for stock classes that will put out a low level controlled amount of eggs and a stock class that we don't have to drench regularly to maintain their productivity. So refugia is simply allowing some susceptible parasites to cycle 
in a controlled fashion so that when a resistant parasite pops up, it is bred out and doesn't continue to be a problem. The question of how to uh, drench and manage clean feeds is, um, is, is one that there is um, a lot of quite strong opinions around. And the, the risk around drenching onto a clean feed, like we talked about before in the refuser explanation, was that that paddock has no existing contamination or very low level. And if I uh, drench animals and immediately put them on that clean feed, the only worms that are coming out of those drenched animals are resistant to the drench I used. And it is a recipe, or it is a, a high risk practice, is to drench animals onto clean feed and not provide a source of refugia. Um, I don't view it as a clean fast rule, don't drench onto clean feed though. Clean feed is a really valuable productive tool, right? I can have animals growing really well on it because of that low contamination. But I just have to be consciously aware that there is no refugia being provided by those drenched animals and I need to provide an adequate refugia source from another practice that I do. So some examples could be because it's clean feed I know I don't have to drench those lambs every 28 days and I monitor so that I can extend my drench interval out to six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks depending on how they're going. That gap between four weeks and eight weeks is a long spell of refugia. Um, I could look to graze my lambs through that area and then rotate some undrenched ewes through it. The undrenched ewes then shed refugia in behind uh, those, those lambs on that clean feed. Um, you know, there, there are multiple ways to, I guess, you know, address the same issue. It's just being consciously aware of the problem and looking for a creative solution that optimizes your productivity while also dealing with that lack of refugia in those situations. Yeah, we've come, come through summer, it's been a dry summer. Um, we've been drenching lambs based on a monitoring program. So rather than setting a date in stone of every four weeks we're going to drench the lambs, we have had lambs on crop, um, assuming that that's a clean feed, and we have monitored to extend the drench intervals between each event. Um, we are now coming off that and going into pasture um, for, for tupping. Um, and so in terms of the lamb drenching program, um, they will receive one last drench um, pre-tup um, and then it will look like about six weeks um, until we will monitor them as they come out um, with the ram being removed. Um, you know, we're using faecal leg counts to um, assist that decision making. We're clearly going to take into account what uh, uh, signs we see in them, what conditions uh, we feel they're in, do we feel they're still on the up and they're growing well, um, are they shedding a lot of dags and you know if we see concerning signs we're going to uh, change our approach as well as interpret those faecal lead counts. Um, in terms of the older stock classes, the, the tutus were identified as having high faecal lead counts um, in February and they've already been drenched. Um, the mixed stage ewes were had low lead counts and, and they're not so there's no drenching in mixed stage use um, going through the autumn. Um, but post ram, uh, we will be monitoring the counts and the U age classes again to make sure there's been no blowout and to make sure we don't have to address some contamination going into the winter. Animal health plans are a process I go through with um, pretty much, I try and encourage with all the clients I work with because. You know, just like our conversation in Refugia before, um, there's a lot of topics that are poorly understood um, and setting aside a couple of hours to work through an annual plan opens up a heap of opportunity to just explain things better. Um, I find generally that once a concept's understood, most farmers are better at coming up with a practical solution that suits them than I am. Um, and it also helps just establish with me the, the approach that that farm's going to take and helps me understand the, the best monitoring program or the best way I can support to make sure that um, things aren't missed, um, that appropriate follow-ups booked and scheduled, um, that I know exactly when things are happening on farm. But you know, 
I can often optimise things to reduce a couple of drench treatments, to align some events better so we don't have lambs coming in three times, we've got them coming in two. We reduce the pneumonia risk because we're not bringing in stuff as frequently. Um, we can schedule body condition scoring events or we can talk about how uh, other disease and use should be best diagnosed to reduce the lamb wastage associated with that. We can look at critical times to um, you know, ensure vaccinations are done appropriately or a lot of the time a, a problem will come out of the woodwork that I've never even heard about. Like, shit, I'm, I'm losing 22% of my lambs and I, as a vet who'd worked with you for five years, had never really heard that from you before and we'd never got into that topic. And so I find that two hours on farm, dedicated set aside to go through an animal health plan, usually opens up a whole heap of topics and a whole heap of potential.